evils, constitutional and practical, of the prelatic establishment of the British Empire, by the Reverend Thomas Nielsen, beginning number three of a course of lectures on the Second Reformation. Lecture three, evils, constitutional and practical, of the prelatic establishment of these lands. In a course of lectures designed to exhibit and elucidate the great principles of the Second Reformation, and to vindicate the distinctive ecclesiastical standing and testimony of the Reformed Presbyterian Church, the prelatical establishment of the British Empire has an early and a special claim upon your, our attention. To pass it by without anima adversion is, we feel persuaded, more than could be reasonably expected by any party of men who have plighted their faith and solemn covenant to endeavor the expiration to endeavor the extirpation of prelacy, whose forefathers, during nearly an entire century, struggled most heroically against imposition of this galling yoke, and who, in their uncompromising opposition to it, endured a great fight of afflictions, and were subjected to sufferings, the bare recital of which causes our ears to tingle, harrows up the soul, and chills the very current of our blood. Let it not be imagined, however, that an early place has been assigned to the exposure of this system simply because it stands condemned in the Solemn League and Covenant, to which, as is well known, we strictly adhere, or that we are actuated in our opposition to prelacy by any mere hereditary prejudice on account of the cruel persecution which our fathers experienced at our hands. No, no. While these important considerations are entitled to influence and cannot but influence our minds in all discussions upon the subject, we beg explicitly to declare that our condemnation of the prelatic establishment in England and Ireland arises from a deep and solemn persuasion that, as a system, it is without foundation in the word of God, and from a solid assurance, grounded upon the experience of, the, of ages, that it has been productive of baleful practical results, and hence must continue to oppose as in times past it has done, a formidable barrier to the extension and establishment of Messiah's glorious and universal empire. Nor is this all. He must be an inattentive observer of the signs of the times indeed, who does not perceive that there are considerations of a special nature, urging us to the performance of this as a present and seasonable duty. It must be fresh in the recollection of all that great pains have of late years been taken that in not a few instances, by individuals from whom better things might have been expected, to persuade the people of Scotland that the persecution under Charles II was really a popish and not a prelatical persecution. It is positioned to fraternize with the Church of England upon the part of eminent ministers of the Scottish establishment, has also, at no very distant period, been matter of notoriety and remark. That the subverters of all established churches should have been regarded as a common enemy by the friends and supporters of both these institutions in our land, and that their defense should have been esteemed a common cause by such individuals, was no doubt perfectly natural. But, as staunch friends of the great scriptural principle of establishments, we have ever thought it matter of deep regret, that on account of agreement in this one point, our once stir sturdy Presbyterians of the North should have indulged in the soft and silken language not merely of palliation, but even of positive eulogy when speaking of the venerable sister establishment, that they should have talked as if the fate of both churches were completely identified, and that they should have suggested accordingly, in pretty plain terms, the propriety of our Presbyterian establishment taking shelter in the day of trial under the splendid bulwarks of prelacy. Hence any proposed interference by the legislature with either department of the prelatical establishment encountered almost as keen opposition on this as on the south side of Tweed. And here a footnote. We are aware that a reaction has begun to take place upon this subject, which in some quarters is progressing rapidly. The above, with what is found in the conclusion to the same effect, is rather applicable, therefore, to certain occurrences a few years past, by which many of our best Presbyterians were deeply and justly aggrieved, then to the present state of matters, although still there is not a wanting ground of complaint on this head. This, we felt persuaded, was wrong in principle, and hence could not fail to prove practically injurious. In her present struggle for spiritual independence, accordingly, we find that the Church of Scotland has had but a small share indeed of sympathy and support from her haughty sister. 
Yea, Episcopalians have not been backward to take advantage of these untoward circumstances for the advancement of their own cause in Scotland, and much as we hear of the alarming progress of popery, it will be found, we are confident, that during the past few years prelacy has gained in the country at least more than double the number of converts, and these too mainly from the upper and influential circles of society. Add to this also the arrogant pretensions lately put forth, or rather revived, by a powerful party in the Church of England, pretensions according to which she is the only true church, yea, the only church, of God in these lands, none other, that of the Rome uh, excuse me, that of Rome alone accepted, having either a regular ministry or the true sacraments. In Scotland we are all unchurched, denominated mere communities of Presbyterians and consigned to the uncovenanted mercies of God. Under such circumstances, no genuine Presbyterian will question the propriety of that arrangement, by which an early and prominent place has been assigned to the exposure of prelacy. We beg farther to premise, however, that while there is much to deplore and condemn, both in the constitution and practice of the Church of England, we do not deny that she is a Church of Christ, that she is the least reformed of the reformed churches, and on various grounds justly obnoxious to the charge of being semi-papistical. We shall by and by adduce ample evidence, but we will not and dare not assume her exclusive tone, nor imitate her offensive example by denying her a place among the Reformed Protestant churches. As the character of many Christians is disfigured by many imperfections, and sometimes exhibits spots which can scarcely be regarded as those of God's children, even so it is with churches. He who walks in the midst of the candlesticks may have somewhat, yea, much against them, but still he may not entirely cast them off. The question, then, is not whether she be a church of Christ, which... Uh, excuse me, that we do not deny.